Okay, so I, I just thank you guys. Really appreciate the opportunity here, and it, we're delighted to have uh, Full House here. Thanks for helping make it happen, volunteers, um, uh, Shy Hack Night team. You know, this is a very unique time um, in history when you know, we can harness the great computational, the cost of computational power is going down. So the computational power to all of us is more available than it ever has been. And we can unleash and use human capital to make uh, our systems like property tax systems more equitable and fair and create better analytics to lead us in the right direction to make further improvements. So for all of you who've thought about volunteering for Shy Hack Night, being involved, this is a really unique time to be involved. It feels really good to use data science for the public good and our data science team really exemplifies this. Uh, there was no data science team before we came in. We saw what was happening. We created the team. And this team has won several big awards recently you know, from the International Association of Assessing Officers, which is the biggest, you know, it's the gold standard in this field. They've recognized the work of this data science team. And we want to show you the latest uh, analytics that, uh, that, and Dan Snow will show those to you, that our team came up with because um, uh, it really helps us to understand the system, crystallize some of the key concepts, key inequities that remain in the system, how they can be changed through this tool that, uh, that Dan is going to show you tonight. So this event is always really useful for our team in helping to crystallize what we've worked on in the last year. And we're so pleased to show you uh, how we've been delivering on you know, what we've been doing in the last year and the last couple of years with Dan Snow. So Dan, uh, how about you come up and show everyone what we got? Fritz. All right, so as Fritz said, my name is Dan Snow. This is now my third time presenting at Chai Hack Night. It feels good to be back. Thank you all. Uh, and tonight we have a somewhat spicy presentation for you titled, Why Are Property Taxes in Chicago So High? And What Can Be Done About It? Uh, so to answer that question, we're gonna cover three topics. One, how do Chicago property taxes actually work? Two, why are Chicago property taxes so damn high? And three, what can be done to lower them? Um, but before we dive in, important note, disclaimer, the Sessions Office does not calculate, send, or collect property tax bills. That is a separate office, is the Treasurer's Office. And there are many other offices involved with property tax administration in Cook County. We are but one small piece. All right, so all that said, disclaimed part one. How do Chicago property taxes actually work? To answer that question, we are gonna look at a tax bill. I know, very exciting. So here is a real example Chicago tax bill from tax year 2021. Uh, and we can see there are many items on it. These are all line items. And each line is a unit of local government and they are grouped by type. So there's schools here, municipalities, et cetera. Each unit of local government has a tax rate that it sets. And that rate is multiplied by the equalized assessed value for that line item to determine the amount that you owe to each district. If you're very confused, you should be, because this is extremely unintuitive. It tells you almost nothing about how your taxes are actually calculated or what drives an increase. Um, and so tonight, we're gonna sort of demystify this bill. Uh, first, we're gonna look at tax rates and figure out how they're actually calculated. And then we're gonna look at assessments. For now, we're gonna ignore assessments and just look at where these numbers that determine the amount that you owe to each tax district actually come from. And to do that, we're gonna go outside of Chicago. We're gonna visit the village of Riverside, which as you can see, slightly west of Chicago right here. Uh, not in Chicago, but the math, all the calculations work exactly the same way. Uh, and then note, from now on, I'm gonna use color to identify different taxing districts and things of importance. So this is the taxing district for the village of Riverside. What is a taxing district? 
taxing district is anything that can set a levy on the value of your home. So they are taxing you, right? This is the district for the village of Riverside. This is its boundary. And each year, the village sets a levy. That levy is the amount that it needs to collect in order to provide services. In tax year 2021, the village of Riverside's levy was around $6 million. So that is the total sum that they need to collect. You, lucky person, are a property owner in Riverside. So this is your property. Uh, it's a 3,000 some square foot home. And on the market, it's worth about $550,000. Uh, the taxable value of your property is not the market value. It's about a third of the market value. So for this property, for your property, it's about $154,000. Now, in order to determine how much you owe to the village of Riverside, what we do is we sum up the taxable value of all properties within Riverside's boundaries. So these are all different properties. And then we divide the amount that Riverside needs by the sum of all of those property values, which is called the base. Fraction looks like this, so if we replace the things in this fraction with real numbers. We have the six million from before divided by the total property value in Riverside, which is its tax base, about $320 million. That results in a tax rate of 1.85% or so. And that rate is what appears on your tax bill. It is multiplied by the taxable value of your property to get the amount that you owe to the village of Riverside. So here, this is sort of like a tax bill line item. This does not appear, this levy base calculation, but these two columns do. And the amount that you end up owing is, you know, around $2,800. But Riverside is not the only thing that you need to pay taxes to. There are many other units of local government. So in addition to the village, you also pay taxes to the elementary school district. In this case, school district 96. And it sets its own levy independent of the village at $27 million. But then it does the exact same calculation. It sums the property value within its boundaries to get a total of $520 million which is everything in orange and everything in purple. So it also includes Riverside's values in its base. And then it adds another line item, right? So this would appear again on your bill. And ultimately you end up paying about $8,000 to the school district. And then it happens again. You have to pay Riverside Township, which has its own levy of $616,000, or $616,000, so you owe them $170. You also have to pay the high school district, right? So it does its own thing, $28 million. It's a larger area, and therefore has a larger tax base, which means you pay it slightly less than the elementary school district. You gotta pay it to the mosquito abatement district, which uh, has a very small levy of 1.5 million. And so you owe it $21. Got to pay to the community college district, right? $31 million. But this one is much, much bigger. And so on and so forth, all the way up to the level of the county, which is the largest taxing district. All of these things are line items on your bills. So if we go back to the real tax bill, here it is, right? Looked at it before. This is the bill that we just made doing our levy divided by base calculation. And if we rearrange it slightly, we can see that all of these lines correspond to line items on the bill. Except the real bill has even more line items than the one that we made. So all in all, there are like 15 some districts that you end up paying to if you live in the village of Riverside. 
And in total, you will pay 19K in property taxes on a home worth $550,000. Uh, that's a very high effective rate. And the effective rate is the amount of taxes that you owe divided by the value of your property. So in this case, 19K divided by 550K. 3.5% is like, you know, around three times the national average. Um, Chicago's effective rate is actually lower than a lot of the Cook County suburbs, you know, a little over 2% in most cases. Uh, and note here that most of that bill actually goes to schools. So that's true in Riverside where you end up paying, you know, 13, 14,000 just to school districts. It's also true of Chicago where CPS is the largest line item on most bills. All right, but what about assessments, right? We've talked about rates, but we are from the assessor's office, so let's talk about assessments, how those work. The assessor's office determines that taxable value that we saw before, right? We try to figure out what a property would sell for on the market, and that is converted via a number of esoteric steps to the taxable value. For residential property, we use machine learning to do that. For commercial property, it's a different approach. It's an income approach. But your, your assessment does not determine your overall sort of bill. It determines the share of the burden that each property, each property pays of the total burden. So we'll dive into that and see how it works. Uh, what that means is that assessments are zero sum, right? So if your assessment goes up, that means that other people's bills are going down. But if your assessment goes down, other people's bills are going slightly up. And to see how that works, we're gonna go back to Riverside. So Riverside is getting a Long John Silvers and everyone's extremely excited so much so that property values right around downtown, they rise by 25%. Uh, and the result, going back to our original levy equation here, our, our rate equation, this is the original, right? The levy does not change. The amount that Riverside needs stays the same. But a certain amount of value growth is added to Riverside's tax base. In this case, $20 million. And you can see that from the original rate, it falls to you know, 1.77%. The result is that your bill decreases because your assessment stayed the same, while the properties in downtown Riverside actually end up paying more because their assessment went up, the rate went down, but not enough to counter the effect of their rising property value. Ultimately, no matter how this shakes out, no matter how assessments are done, Riverside will still get its $6 million dollar levy because the tax rate will adjust to ensure that they get it. All right, so that is a very small picture of how the overall system works, but it's the important stuff. So key takeaways here are just that the levies determine the overall burden, so the amount that in aggregate everyone has to pay. And assessments determine the share of the burden that your property is responsible for. All right, so now that we all know all that, we can move on to this question. So why are Chicago property taxes so high? It's mostly back to rates, right? So this equation is very important. If the levy goes up, the rate goes up, and if the base goes down, then the rate goes up, right? And there are lots and lots of ways for these two things to happen. And we're gonna go through some of them. As we go through them, I will put up which of these is happening in the upper right-hand corner. So first, levies are going up. So this is all the levies in Chicago indexed to 2008. Up here is the city, and you can see that since 2008, the city levy has essentially doubled. You know, it's increased quite a lot. Uh, a lot of that increase came in like 2015, 
or so. And you can see the slope of the line there. CPS, likewise, has gone up pretty significantly, not as much as the city, but still a lot. Uh, and then this is CPIU, right? So this is inflation. Both of these levies for the city, which make up the majority of city property tax bills, have gone up much more than CPIU. Cook, way down here, you also pay taxes to Cook if you live in Chicago. Its levy has remained pretty constant over time, actually. And then these other lighter lines, not sure if you can see them. These are other taxing districts in the city of Chicago whose levies have also gone up. All right, so that's levies. Levies are going up. Let's talk about TIFs. Take a long detour. So for those not familiar or engrossed in the world of municipal finance, uh, a TIF is a tool that can be used by municipalities to basically fund economic development in specific areas. And they're a little complicated, but how they work is essentially they freeze the tax base and any growth over that frozen amount, the revenue from the growth is diverted into the special TIF fund, which is used to fund development. That fund is supposed to be spent on the area within the TIF, to be clear. Uh, however, TIFs are a little weird because they can actually result in higher taxes for all properties, not just those inside of the TIF. Let's see how that works. So we're going back to Riverside and Long John Silvers. All right, so before we got the Long John Silvers, we had 25% growth and the base uh, increased a little bit and so the rate fell. Now, Riverside decides it wants to capture that Long John Silvers growth with a TIF. Uh, and so as a result, they establish a TIF right before that growth happens. And the growth that would otherwise be used to lower the tax rate is instead locked up in the TIF, right? It basically goes into the TIF fund rather than being uh, used to lower the rate. And if we replace this again with real numbers, right, again, Riverside's levy, $6 million. The base is exactly the same with 320 some million dollars. That growth, the $20 million in tax growth from the long, or in um, taxable value from the Long John Silvers, were it not for the TIF, would lower the rate to 1.77%. But because the TIF is there, uh, that revenue will be diverted, the increment will not lower the base, and the rate will remain high. So, all of that said, uh, it seems a little weird, but TIFs are not necessarily bad. They're just a tool. Uh, they can spur development where one had not occurred, or where it would not have occurred. Um, however, TIFs are a little tricky, because if the growth would have occurred without the spending for development from the TIF, then you're essentially capturing growth that would otherwise increase the base and lower tax rates. So if you think that the growth would have occurred without the TIF, you're effectively raising property taxes. And then Chicago TIFs are especially weird and complicated because they have a sort of history of being opaque and sort of hard to oversee you can move money between them, right? If they are touching each other, which is a little bit weird. Um, but the even larger problem is that Chicago really loves TIFs. So they're putting them everywhere. Uh, so 2006 is on the left, and this is the sort of land area covered by TIFs. 2021 is on the right. And you can see that there's just been a sort of explosion in the land area covered by TIFs. Right, we went from 19% to 34% of land area, and 9% of all pins to 14% of all pins. And that means that the base is effectively lowered, right? And therefore, rates will be higher than they would without the TIFs. As TIFs grow older, and as there are more of them covering more area, more and more of the tax base will get locked up inside of the TIF 
rather than increasing the base and lowering rates. So that is sort of what this is showing. As of 2021, around 15% of the total tax base's value is locked up inside of TIFFs. All right, so beyond TIFFs, there's some other stuff. Uh, this is new this year, the recapture provision, just covered in a recent treasurer's office report. Uh, and the way this works is if you appeal your assessment, if you're unhappy with it, you think it's too high, you have many opportunities to do so. Uh, at certain points, if you want to appeal and you succeed, that money will come back out of the taxing district's bank accounts. So they essentially lose money that they would have depended on to provide services. This new provision, again, new in 2021, essentially lets taxing districts automatically raise rates the following year in order to recover the money that they lost to appeals. So this is effectively an automatic tax increase if people are successfully appealing every year. But what about assessments? All right, we're coming back to this again. So assessments, as I'm sure most of you know, have changed a lot. Um, and they've changed who pays what. Right, so values have decreased in historically over-assessed areas, and they've increased for rapidly appreciating areas and certain classes of properties. Uh, and then appeals also have a big effect. We'll talk about that in a minute. So here is map of Chicago. Hope we're all familiar. This is the median percent change in AV by census tract. And you can see the areas that have changed the most, right? Basically, the south and the west sides have had their assessments decrease. The sort of uh, northwest, southwest, and north-north side Rogers Park area have had their AVs go up a lot. Everywhere else is sort of in the middle of those two. Um, notably, these are pretty big percentage changes. And the reason for that is because assessments in Cook County only occur every three years. So this is basically three years of growth. And if things were underassessed in 2018, we're also adding that percentage change to get them back to the level that they should be at. Right, these are big changes. Um, but that said, given sort of trends in the current housing market, uh, and the increasing stability of the models that we use, I'm confident that they will not be quite this high in the future. But who's to say? Um, let's look at appeals really quick. So I mentioned them before. There are many avenues for appeal, but the main two are with our office, the assessor's office, and with an independent office called the Board of Review, who is like, primary function is to process assessment appeals. And as I mentioned before, since assessments are zero sum, large drops on property appeals can result in high bills for people who did not appeal. And this point is a little confusing, but essentially the overall share of the total assessed value uh, held by one class or another is a good proxy for the sort of total tax burden that they are being asked to pay. And so we can look at a plot like this using that knowledge to determine how exactly appeals have played out in the past. So the appeal cycles are on the bottom, right? We have the mailed. We have, those are the initial values, not appealed. We have assessor appeals, which are appeals with our office. And we have board appeals, right, which are at the board of review. These dotted lines are reassessment years for Chicago. And our axis here is the percent of the total AV property value held by commercial properties. And you can see a pretty distinct pattern here, right? So these reassessment years, what happens is we mail values, they go up a lot for commercial. So commercial is holding a 
larger share of the tax base. And then immediately following that increase, at least back here, they go down, right? And this is from appeals, right? In more recent times, what's happened is, you know, we were under assessing commercial properties. They were under assessed for a long time. In an effort to correct that problem, right, we had a big increase for commercial. They took on a larger percentage of the tax base. That's this mailed value here. People appealed with our office, came down a little with us, came down a lot with the Board of Review, where they actually ended up, after appeals were done, holding a smaller percentage of the tax base than they were in 2020. <laughs> So, what are the takeaways here? Most of Chicago's high property tax burden is due to changes in rates, things that affect rates, right? That's the levy, um, it's use of TIFs, it's recapture law, it's other things that we have not even talked about. Um, but assessments and appeals, they do play a role. They determine who pays you know, the bigger share of that increased burden. All right, so now we're on to the really spicy stuff. What can be done to lower property taxes? To answer that question, I am very excited to introduce a new public R package and database uh, that we call PTAXSIM. And PTAXSIM stands for Property Tax Simulator. The basic function of the package is to basically calculate Cook County line item tax bills. And it can do that for every property for the last 16 years, which means that you get 350 some million line items of property tax data to play with if you calculate every single bill. Uh, currently, this tool is not very publicly usable um, it's an R package, you sort of have to know how to program in order to use it. Um, so right now, the target audience is academics and journalists, people of that, that sort. Um, however, we do hope to create a sort of public friendly front end in the near future. So I mentioned the ability to estimate tax bills as the main function, but the real power of this tool is the ability to calculate counterfactual bills. So we can calculate bills as if something had happened and see what the effect of different levers are within the property tax system. So we're gonna use it. We're gonna pull some different levers and see what happens. Now, before I show you these numbers, uh, take them with a grain of salt. It's really complicated and hard to do this, so they're not easy to do. Uh, if you do want to see the code, big link right here, bit.ly slash ptexim. All right, so we're going to look at three sort of what if categories. And I chose these because they would not require huge legislative changes. They're mainly things that taxing districts can do on their own. Uh, and one very important note about ptexim. We are using this tool to look at a counterfactual past. We're not projecting into the future. It can do that, but we're not doing it today. So everything is, what if this situation had happened in the past? You know, what would this person's be, bill be instead of what it actually is? All right, and these are the three categories of counterfactuals that we're gonna look at. So what if levies were frozen? What if tips did not exist? And what if appeals were altered? And to answer those, we're gonna look at one single subject property because it makes it a little easier. So this is a two flat in Pilsen, it's off 18th Street. It's 2021 market value determined by the assessor. It was around $530,000. And that resulted in a tax bill a little less than 11K. Uh, this is like a pretty typical multifamily property in terms of characteristics and value. So it's a good example. Um, and note that we're not changing the assessed value for this property throughout all of the following scenarios. Another very important note, the results from this pin are sort of broadly applicable to Chicago, 
because Chicago, for the most part, shares a very similar tax rate. It's mostly like one large taxing district, and so the rate is always gonna move through for most properties at the same time. All right, so let's jump into the counterfactuals. What if levies were frozen? What would happen? So just to walk you through this table really quick, in the leftmost column, we have our counterfactual scenarios. The next column is our tax bill. The very first row here is the real bill, the bill they actually got in 2020. And then every one below that, every row, is a counterfactual 2021 tax bill. So what would this pin, what would this Pilsen property have paid if this scenario had come to pass? The other columns are the dollar change from that baseline and the percentage change. And for scenarios that go more than one year, this is the cumulative change collected across all years that the scenario is taking place. So let's go through them. First one, if city levies had been frozen under Mayor Lightfoot, city council had not increased levies at all, what would this pin end up paying? Well, it would be around $236 less than it actually did in 2021. Expanding a little, so if ROM and that administration had not increased levies at all, and then Lori had just resumed and done what she actually did in real life, what would this pin be? Or what would the bill be? And it would be about $1,200 less than it was in 2020. Uh, this third one, I was inspired by last week's presentation um, which talked about the sort of disconnect between CPS student enrollment and the amount that they collect in property taxes. CPS enrollment has been going down, but the amount they collect has been going up. So I was just curious, you know, what would happen if you basically tied the levy to enrollment? And the result is a much lower bill, right? It's actually, you know, $3,100 lower than what they would have paid in 21. And then we can go full maximalist, sort of, you know, what would happen if we just froze all the levies, we just stopped increasing them entirely in 2006. And then in that case, we would be paying around $4,500 less on this property. So graphically, this looks like this, right? This baseline, the percent change is zero, so this is what they actually paid. And then the percentage decrease for each year is just how much lower as a percent their bill would be in that year. So this corresponds, you know, uh, this is around 2%. If we go back to the table, it's around 2% lower from the baseline. All right, so that's levies. What about TIFs? So let's look at TIFs. Again, we're paying around 11,000 11, um, on this pin as a baseline. Now we can just look at TIFs and basically start removing them. You know, what, how would that actually affect people's bills? So the largest TIF by revenue, besides the red-purple modernization TIF, is LaSalle Central. I think we are in it right now, potentially, maybe. Um, if that TIF was just deleted tomorrow, it would net this bill a $264 decrease. Likewise, if we scale up, to the top 10 TIFs by revenue, so the largest TIFs collecting the most money, it would save this pin about $1,000 on their 2021 bill. If all TIFs, all Chicago TIFs, were just deleted from existence, this pin would save about $1,500. And if all TIFs in Cook County were deleted, because there are many TIFs in the suburbs, uh, it would actually still affect Chicago or, or Cook County's tax rate a little bit and lower the bill even further to around $1,600. So here's that graph again. Grayed out is the ones that we just looked at before. You can see that as values have recovered since 2008, we've sort of had an increase in the effects of TIFs and how much they are capturing from this bill, which I found very interesting. 
but some important caveats here. Many TIFFs are retiring soon anyways. So we may not, you know, you don't have to delete them by ordinance or whatever. A lot of them expire. They have a lifespan of 23 years. Many TIFFs were made in sort of the late 90s and early 2000s. Some of them are up for extension. So you can optionally extend them for 12 years for a total of 35 years. Uh, and then a important TIFF note here is that the TIFF increment only returns to the tax base if the districts that are covering the TIFF choose not to raise their levy to capture the additional increment. This is very confusing, but suffice to say, it is not guaranteed that when a TIFF expires, that money will lower rates, right? All right, and finally, let's go to appeals. So what if appeals were altered? Very important note for this scenario. Uh, it only applies to this pin. So we're only looking at how this would affect this pin. The thing I said before about this being broadly applicable to Chicago does not hold here. So, all right. So again, we have our baseline. And then the first scenario here, undoing about sort of 600 or so, you know, very large appeals from commercial that were done at the Board of Review. How would that actually impact this PIN's bill? Well, it would be about $400 lower. And if we scale that up and undo all commercial appeals from the Board of Review, this PIN's bill would be about $700, $750 lower. And then again, because the full maximalist position is, is weird and fun to calculate, if we just literally got rid of appeals and there had been no appeals since 2006, this PIN's bill would be about $1,800 lower. All right, so gone through our three questions. What are the takeaways? Well, the tax system is very complicated. There are lots of different levers that you can pull to change bills. Not all of them have very obvious consequences, and there are many that we just didn't even talk about today. But I am hopeful that with this new tool and you know, it being publicly accessible, people can sort of experiment with pulling different levers to figure out how different policy changes to the system would actually ultimately impact people's bills and that this tool will be a sort of light in the dark and help us aim toward a fairer, better property tax system. Before we do this, I'm gonna invite Nicole up. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Nicole Jardine. I am the Chief Data Officer. And if you are listening and you are interested in assessment equity and you wanna build your data science skills, we will be hiring. Uh, for those of you here, uh, feel free to scan our QR code. There will be two job postings going live on Friday. And for those of you at home, keep an eye on cookcountyassessor.com. Um, and you'll scroll down about halfway down the page and look for a job opportunities button. So, thanks. Back to you, Dan. Thank you, Nicole. All right. Questions? I'm sure there are many. Oh. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So I have a, a very simple question, but like at the start, you showed that the actual, I think it was the EAP is one third of like the property tax value or like the assessed value. Why is, like, why is that number there? Like why not just use the raw assessed uh, value of the property? That's a more complicated question than you probably <laughs> suspect it is. Uh, the basic answer is that the assessed value is 10% of the market value. And then the state calculates an equalizer to try to basically equalize the assessed values of all the other counties in Illinois that is then multiplied by that 10% to get around a third. Usually the equalizer is around like 0.3. Uh, if that meant nothing to you, that's, that's fine. It's very confusing and weird. Um, I'm happy to explain it further afterwards if you'd like. Yeah, it's a very complicated question. Uh, what percentage of, well, let's, let's put commercial aside, but just uh, residential apply for assessment? 
Everyone is assessed. You don't you uh, not have to apply. Apply for um, appeal. Sorry, I meant. Oh, I actually don't know. Do you guys, do you know? Our director of comms is here. I'm going to punt the question. Fritz, do you know? I'm, I'm unsure. In the most recent year, I think we had a little bit over 300,000 uh, appeals. Um, now that is down by a third from where they were uh, in 2018. Um, so it's, it's roughly that amount. We, we are almost completing the 2022 cycle now, so we could give you a more up-to-date number. Yeah. Um, they've gone down three straight years, but our numbers are still high. This jurisdiction, um, I think the amount of appeals that they have in Harris County and Houston is greater than ours now. Uh, it may be higher in Dallas, but we're just, we're kind of a, a, really an anomaly in the rest of the United States. In most of the U.S., even in large jurisdictions, it's a mid to small single digit number that appeals. So our culture here in Cook County, because assessments have been accurate for so long, and because there are so many industries and political incentives that rewarded driving appeals, have sort of taught a lot of people to feel like they need to appeal. And we are sort of, a lot of the work of our team is about building trust and uh, trying to show behaviors that you don't necessarily have to engage in the behaviors that you learned before. Um, but in the end, this is something we have in the state that has been created over time. So this might not be directly related to a, a property taxes, but uh, so the idea of property taxes is for mu municipalities to, ra to raise finances for development work. And I guess like TIF is, is part of that uh, you know, as part of that um, uh, initiative, uh, where do do you have any idea where um, municipal bonds come into this uh, picture? I am not knowledgeable enough on public finance to answer that, so I will uh -oh. not attempt it. I know that there are people in this room who are knowledgeable enough to answer that question, though. So I will point you to them uh, after if you want to talk to me. Did you want I don't want to geek out too much on municipal bonds. No. Um, basically, uh, uh, when if you're an issuer of municipal bonds, the greater the size of your EAV, the more the bond market likes it because it gives you greater ability to raise financing. TIFs also are closely tied to the bond market because the expected future revenues inside a TIF can then be brought into the present through, lever through creating a municipal bond. So you may have 20 years of expected new revenues inside the TIF. That TIF can go out and borrow and raise that money now. This is what we're seeing with the red line. This is why mayors like TIFs, because you get to take revenues that otherwise would go to other taxing bodies, borrow against them, and use them now for things. Uh, the p tax sim looks great and uh it's a it's a wonderful tool and uh i have a question about it are you are you going to be continuing to update it with uh, the models that you that you create and find more valid and uh, and the latest data uh we will continue to update the tool with all of the data that is currently in it so as yearly data comes out we will add it yes that's great. Yeah. I really hope somebody, some budding data scientist at Chai Hack Night decides to take this on as a project and then continue it at Chai Hack Night because that would be great. I agree. I think that would be great. Uh, I do want to add, you know, um, I'm not sure people have quite realized yet the scope or the utility of the tool. This data was just not aggregated in one place before, ever, besides the mainframe. Right, so the fact that it is now in one place and that researchers and people can go and look at all of this data, use it, calculate counterfactuals with it, is a big deal. And I really want people to use this tool to do more of what I showed up here and get you know a little less silly with it and do actual policy analysis to see how we could lower bills. It's worth noting that the data has been published before by like the kind clerk. Um, but Dan is right to mention that's never been in one 
centralized database. Yes, correct. Yeah, I had to OCR a lot of PDFs. It was really unpleasant. But again, this is leveraging the historic impact of computational power getting cheaper. And then not only our data science team can apply their human capital to get gains out of it, but so can the public. So can you. This is why we love to come here, because you might get some insights and usefulness of this tool that we might not have thought of. And we want to, we want to have an ecosystem where people are able to leverage you know, computational power and tools like this for public good. Uh, so from the live stream, what is the countywide rhythm for assessments? Uh, the county is reassessed every three years. So it's divided up into three parts called triads. And each part is reassessed every three years. So it's sort of on a cycle. Um, this year is the South Tri. Uh, last year, you know, North Tri, city before that, et cetera. Hey, so all of this is obviously very complex. A lot of legacy data, a lot of legacy systems. How do you go about procuring the services and technology to modernize this and make sure that you're moving forward and it's not just all held together with your own, the brilliance of your team and the people here now? How do you partner with the business community to make sure that we can get some, some more refined systems? Hmm. It is a good question, and I am no expert on procurement, but I think that the more people that we can loop in and get invested in the tool, the better, right? Because that sort of ensures that it has a user base, ensures that it will have continuity in case our team, for whatever reason, dissolves. Um, but, you know, as I said, we plan to support it into the future with the resources that we have. Um, hopefully we will be able to get more. I'm not sure how to answer that question. Um, yeah, so my question is uh, maybe kind of asking the same question in a slightly different way of the title of the talk, mm -hmm. uh, which is, it was really interesting to explore like how taxes could be lower. Um, I'd be curious to look at that from like a more progressive lens and is there a way, and is there a role for the assessor's office in making tax rates lower for folks who can afford to pay them less than others? I'm going to go ahead and punt that one to France. <laughs> um, so uh, the, there are several different things that we can do. Actually, one of the most uh, impactful things that can be done legis legislatively and, and politically is kind of accepted as given in what Dan gave there. You know, why are schools the majority of levies in um, Illinois? That's a good question, because it's not inherently so. Actually, in this state, we are last in the United States for the amount of um, school budgets that are covered by our state. So in our state, about 25% of school budgets are covered by uh, state support. In most states, it's closer to 50. In state of Indiana, for example, property tax rates are lower simply because they have county income taxes that help to defray the cost of education. We do not have those here. Um, so the, the, the greatest inequity of all really is that choice that's made by our state to so underfund school districts and then put the onus on communities to raise the, support, the resources themselves to educate their children who are our children. Um, and think about if you're in, in Harvey. Harvey's a community that uh, has been pummeled by the effect of the housing bust in 2007, 2008, 2009. Its retail has been pummeled by Amazon and e-commerce. Um, and deindustrialization has also hollowed out its industrial base. So it has a tiny base left, even if assessments are metaphysically perfect, there's no bias in them, automatically just by the state's funding choice, you generate the highest rates in Cook County, some of the highest rates in Cook County. And actually the rates in Harvey are six times what they are in Chicago, six times. So for some, a good person who bought their home in Harvey, 
they are expected to pay over you know, six times what a Chicagoan is for the amount of money they put in their house just to have uh, to be able to educate children in their community. That is very unfair. Now, it's not only the state that covers education spending, it's also uh, the federal government which can do it. There's something called um, Title I. It represents about 8% of school budgets. It's been frozen for decades. It was created uh, in the Great Society under LBJ. Uh, President Biden proposed doubling the budget, but eventually it was whittled down to just a single-digit percentage point increase in Title I. I think I've written an article about this for the Chicago Council on Global Affairs. As our economy is becoming more digital and less uh, uh, bricks and mortar oriented in its structure, the, the disparity becomes greater. You know, the digital side of our economy basically gets a free pass in educating our children, while brick and mortar have to assume more and more burdens. The, the disparity will grow between communities like Harvey and wealthy low-rate communities the more that we ignore this question. Um, what can we do within the assessment system given that the way these levies are determined is very inequitable? That's making sure that every single kind of property is fairly assessed. So the data that Dan showed um, is that the difference in opinion between the assessor's office and the board review on commercial properties represents a $700 impact for that homeowner in Pilsen. And actually, if you look at all the average values of houses in Chicago, that size of impact is greater than the, it's the majority of the increase in all the wards that did have increases. So if you look in the 25th ward, 26th ward, 36th, 33rd ward, wards that have experienced a lot of gentrification, actually the majority of the increase in their bills is represented by the cuts that were made on commercial properties at the Board of Review. So this is where, you know, when we're thinking about the inequities that we can address in our work at the assessor's office, it's showing through better data, using better methods, using IT, working with the board review method to come up with a methodology so that that difference is narrowing um, and that burden is not being put on, on homeowners where this is, so much of this is stacked against them. That's to answer your question. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I, PTAC SIM is just a really wonderful tool, and congratulations for putting it out, and uh, we're, we're very appreciative of it. But um, I guess one thing is, of course, I'm always gonna ask for more. Um, we, you know, PTAC SIMS gives us the assessments, but it doesn't give us any of the information behind the assessments, hmm. any of the character, property characteristics, except the location, really. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, is it possible to do something that will make that kind of information more open and more accessible so we can understand that better? Uh, it's a great question. That data already exists and it is all already public. Um, so if you go on the Cook County Data Portal, we have a couple open data sets, including our parcel universe, which contains every pin in the county for the last, uh, a long time, 20 some years. Um, along with all of the property characteristics. If you wanna get very deep in the weeds, the data that is actually used to train the assessment models is also available on GitLab, just as extracts. So the data that we used for each year is all just there, you can go and download it right now. Um, I don't think that we will include that inside of PTAC SIM, mostly because it's an issue of size. <laughs> PDAC SIM is an R package, but it's also just a SQLite database. So it's a file that has a database in it. That database is already like eight gigabytes with just the tax data. If we include characteristics and all this other stuff as well, it would balloon to be just sort of unmanageable um, for most people. All that said, we do plan to add a bunch more data to PDAC SIM, just not the characteristic data. Um, but some of the things that I would really like to gather are, for instance, data on every TIFF, aggregated, cleaned, put into a consistent format. So that is some data on all SSAs, data on legislation, all sorts of things can and I hope eventually will go in there.
Um, and then I think someone on the live stream was asking about an individual situation. So could someone from the assessor's office remind us the best way that people should reach out in, in, for that type of thing? <laughs> Uh, yeah, just go to cookcountyassessor.com. Um, there are a couple of ways to email us, call us. Um, yeah, lots of ways to get in touch. Thank you. All right, thank you, everybody, please. Thank you to Dan. Thank you.